Hi, everybody. Uh, it's really, uh, my name is James Olson. I'm the director of the Paul Paper Center. And uh, it's really my pleasure today to welcome all of you. I was telling Harry that I've probably never seen the room so uh, full for a presentation on a sunny Thursday, or almost any time, actually. So anyways, I'm very happy to uh, present Harry Brummer's uh, presentation today. He's really uh, offered to uh, present on behalf of the uh, Bioeconomy Research Initiative, or BERI. And um, so I'm, I was going to introduce Harry to everybody, but he told me that he's prepared his own presentation. Uh, so I'm very happy to do it. great for him to do that. I do want to say that uh, it's a real pleasure to have everybody here at UBC. I know many people have come from uh, a fair bit of ways, as well as the community here. And uh, with that welcome, I will uh, leave it to you to present your uh, work. Okay, thank you, James. Yeah. Um, and I guess I'd like to begin by thanking James for this opportunity. Really, um, what I wanted to do today was take the, the chance to introduce who I am and what I do in the context of Barry to those of you who may not have been around or involved when I was originally recruited to, uh, to UBC. So I'm sort of in some way new on campus. I've been here uh, now it's about a year and a half. But I was previously at the uh, Royal Institute of Technology in Stockholm, Sweden. So um, there was a, a call that NSL put out for a couple of faculty positions um, associated to the, to the Barry program, the Bioenergy and Refining Initiative, which was really spearheaded by people at the NSL, especially Chip Haynes, as well as Jack Sadler and others in forestry. So uh, that call really prompted me to put in an application. I was working in Sweden for about 12 years. I'll get to that in a moment. Um, and well, one thing led to another, and I'm here today. And so I guess you could say that I'm sort of the Michael Smith's lab, the Michael Smith Lab's second most, uh, or certainly less famous, connection to, to Sweden. Michael Smith <laughs> there getting the Nobel Prize from the Swedish team. So with that, really, I wanted to use this again, use this opportunity to introduce myself, especially in the context of. James was gracious enough to induct me into the Pulp and Paper Center as an adjunct member. So I thought I'd take the opportunity to kind of highlight some of the work that we do on the fiber science side. And this is, this is really a self-indulgent title where I tried to figure out how many times I could put bio into the title. So we've got four in there so far. Um, but a bit on my background, and really my being here today, I owe sort of a debt of gratitude to a number of people especially Jim Kronstadt and Mike Freisig, uh, director of the MSL and head of chemistry, who really uh, did a lot of work to, to make the appointment happen. Chip Haynes, especially for being a big proponent, uh, um, and Jack Sadler and Sean Mansfield, who were actually the first two guys who uh, encouraged me to apply. Actually, I met them in a, uh, a biorefining conference in northern Sweden, uh, must be two and a half, three years ago now, and Sean said, oh, you should just apply. At least you'll get a plane, a free plane ticket to come here. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought that was a good enough excuse. So, so here I am. And really, my independent academic career started back in 1999 when Tula Thierry recruited me to Sweden as an assistant professor. She's a uh, fungal geneticist. And together, we developed a lot of the fiber modification technology I'll tell you about today. Uh, before that, I worked with this guy who's hiding out in the back of the room, Steve Withers there. So I was over at UBC Chemistry for a little while, and prior to that, I did my PhD in England with a carbohydrate uh, and small just named Mike Sinnott, who coincidentally also happens to be Steve Withers' PhD supervisor. So there's a little bit of a connection there. But in any case, my educational history really comprises organic chemistry segueing into carbohydrate chemistry and carbohydrate enzymology. And just to give a little bit of context, especially for the people in the audience who might be familiar with Stockholm and the fiber science, the great fiber science that goes on in the Royal Institute of Technology and also at Invencia ex SDFI, we were situated in this building, the Albanova University Center, which is centrally located between the KKH main campus, the Karolinska Institute, and Stockholm University here on the north side of, of campus. And I was working in the Division of Glycoscience. Uh, we were really four PIs working in the area of, of um, 
I guess you could say, carbohydrate enzymology and fiber science. And we were involved in a number of uh, larger research initiatives, uh, two of which were spearheaded within the division, and one of which was uh, led by KTH, uh, large paper in, in uh, fiber polymer technology. So in any case, a central theme in these, these uh, research centers was understanding the plant cell wall as a vehicle to come up with new and better uses of biomass. So that's really what my lecture is going to touch on. For those of you who heard my, uh, my uh, lectures when I was here um, looking for the job or, or interviewing for the job the first time, some of this will be redundant, but I'll try to keep try to give you some new angles and, and hopefully keep it entertaining here for the next 45 minutes or so. And what I really wanted to, to start with is to say that one of the things that attracted me from KTH and, and this sort of interesting cluster of research centers that we had was really the, the tremendous diversity of um, competence here on the UBC campus, especially within the Barry envelope. I think it's really a testament to uh, Chip's vision, Jack's vision, and, and many others, that really UBC comprises an, an incredible diversity of, of scientists working from the fundamental, um, sort of on the fundamental plant cell wall biosynthesis side, all the way up to applications, uh, chemistry, a lot of enzyme discovery going on, and then this connection into these, these different graduate programs, such as the Working on Walls Create program, uh, Chibi and the Affiliated Genome Science and Technology uh, Create program. Of course, the industrial connections through FP Innovations and the Pulp and Paper Center. And then the tremendous equipment resources we have on campus through things like the Laboratory of Molecular Biophysics. So for me as a carbohydrate entomologist who sort of dabbles in applications, this is really quite a, an impressive palette to me. And when we start thinking about biorefining, I mean, I think we're really in a, a sort of golden age for plant cell wall research and applications. Because, of course, there are all these strong motivators, climate, the end of big oil or cheap oil. And as a consequence, I really believe that there is a lot of room to do very exciting plant cell wall um, biochemistry and then leading into applications. So really this image is, I think, comprises or, or is a nice summary of the sentiment that we can go from biomass all the way up to, uh, to chemicals, fuels, and materials. And of course, this is sort of the general flow when we start thinking about biorefinery. And we can imagine you know, developing or selecting improved feedstocks using, for example, forest biotechnology, uh, plant biotechnology, the sort of things that the botanists are excellent at um, here. Sean Mansfield, of course, has a very strong uh, tree development program. We have all the biocatalyst development work that goes on around campus, and it's enzyme discovery. And I don't mean to restrict it only to biological catalysis, but of course we have all sorts of um, chemical and thermochemical treatments, which lead that into different conversion technologies. And I think here we have really nice connections between the sort of enzyme discovery that goes on across campus and the sorts of applications into, um, for example, cell wall securification that Jack Sadler is spearheading. And of course, out of these programs, we can get all sorts of interesting um, biorefining products. We can get monosaccharides, which can be fermented to fuels and small molecules. We can get polysaccharides as building blocks. We can get out fibers, and together these can be put into new materials. Of course, lignans can have been classically used as fuels to fuel the pulp and paper industry, but also they're being developed into new materials. And then not to, to forget that there are thermochemical methods to get at these things. And if we take the previous slide and sort of map that onto this, this flow, you see that actually UBC nicely represents all of these steps. And I think that's really the, the true kind of power or the, I, I would say, the uh, potential of Barry to kind of unite all of these different um, expertise is under one, one sort of umbrella and banner. So when we talk about biomass, really this is a complex biocomposite. Right? If we look at the organism, whole organism level, we can drill down and see that there's tissue level organization, cellular organization, and this is really built on macromolecular networks. 
So my interest is really in carbohydrate enzymology, one of the key building blocks of biomass. Of course, there's lignin protein in there as well. And really, my jumping off point is that all of this complexity is, is built, rearranged, and broken down by, in principle, or primarily carbohydrate active enzymes. And we can look at both plants and microbes as a source of new, new biocatalysts. And really, it comes down to how can we use biomass better? And again, coming from my Swedish perspective, that this coupling of understanding cell wall biosynthesis, such as um, being studied in the Funk Fiber Center at UPSC, together with its biological materials focus, I think is really quite powerful. So we really do need to understand better how biomass is built up, so we can engineer it to maybe make it easier to take apart. Then we obviously need to study ultrastructure, mechanical and, and physical properties, and understand, of course, its biodegradation. And that really sets the framework for designing new materials and deconstructing biomass to, to fuels and chemicals. And we, when we think about biomass biotechnology, there are really a couple of ways we can go to come up with new materials or fuels or what have you. But really, what a lot of, our, a lot of us do is draw inspiration from nature. We can look into the genomes and transcriptomes and using all the omics technology uh, into the biocatalysts that are produced either by microorganisms or plants using modern DNA sequencing tools, modern transcriptomic tools, and we can use this to select new targets or we can select targets. And then classically, we can use, for example, forest biotechnology to, for example, increase tree growth with a subsequent effect on, for example, fiber length. And of course, fiber length is of direct interest to for material properties, especially in the pulp and paper area. So again, we can control biomass at, at the level of biosynthesis, but alternatively, we can discover new enzymes in these systems and then apply them for, for example, fiber modification ex vivo. Okay. And this is really the approach that, that my group takes, but again, here on campus, we have um, Sean Mansfield and, for example, many people have bought me surrounding me to create WOW program we're looking into these sorts of aspects. And just to give an example of how this can be coupled, this is just an example of our Carbomat Research Center that we started in Sweden, which really pins together enzyme discovery, polysaccharide metabolic engineering, chemical and enzymatic polysaccharide modification to make small or nano building blocks. Now these could be either um, cellulosic fibers or polysaccharides, which we can then synthesize or put together into nano composites. Now this is really just a small fraction, but I think I really believe that some of these ideas can be mapped on or can be really exploited or harnessed within the very concept that coupling these different aspects of, of chemistry and biochemistry with material science so emerging carbohydrate biotechnology and new materials concepts can be really powerful. So that's really just to reiterate that I think a lot of these sorts of approaches can be really um, enabled or, or brought up to speed here on, on the UBC campus. So now to turn the focus a little bit more into what, what I do specifically, we again in the group use uh, enzyme discovery technologies, we mine genomes, we mine transcriptomes to look for interesting enzymatic targets. We can produce those recombinantly in microbial hosts, that is we can produce these enzymes so that we can study the biochemistry further. We do a lot of uh, probe synthesis, assay development, again to study biochemistry, and then working in collaboration we determine the structures of these proteins to really connect protein structure and function. And once we understand how these biocatalysts work, then we can apply them for downstream fiber modification. So we do some applications in, well, enzyme engineering, but primarily what I'm going to talk about today is chemoenzymatic polysaccharide modification. And again, when we're hunting for, for new enzymes, obviously microbes have been a rich source of enzymes for breaking down the plant cell wall. All of the hydrolytic enzymes that we use in, when we think about second generation biofuels, They've all come from, uh, from microbes. We've also looked at plants as a source because effectively they build up biomass. So we can find new 
catalyst to add functionality into, into biomass. So really, the rest of the talk is going to be, and I'll draw on another Swedish concept here. This, it'll be a smorgasbord of little bits and pieces. And the idea with the smorgasbord is that actually you should taste a little bit of everything. Now, normally what happens is your eyes are usually bigger than your stomach, so you end up taking too many things and you sort of become overfull and, and, and stuff. So we'll see how I do it today. I've tried to pare this talk down, but I suspect we'll have to curtail it here in the end. But um, what I'd like to start with, really, is just to give you, in about three slides, the flavor of enzyme discovery. And if we're in carbohydrate biochemistry, and if we're interested in finding enzymes to break down complex carbohydrates like the one I show here, looking in nature, we can find that actually in six different enzyme families of structurally very different folds, we have the same capacity to cleave this bond right here. And it becomes of interest to us as carbohydrate entomologists, what actually confers these different scaffolds with this catalytic ability, and why, for example, in certain families, can we find enzymes which are very selective for the complex polysaccharide in its totality? Well, we can also find enzymes that cleave only this unsubstituted congener. Okay, so there's a lot of interesting aspects to look at within genetic diversity for finding new catalysts. And this is just one example. For example, a certain, in this given protein family, we can look at the molecular phylogeny. So this is essentially a distribution of the catalytic activities and sequences in this family. And we can see that they sort of cluster into different groups. And using enzyme kinetics with well-defined substrates, together with structural biology, we can see that actually some of the enzymes which cluster in a certain clade have actually evolved an extra domain, which extend the active site here as it rolls around to really make productive binding with these large oligosaccharides. So what this enzyme has done is it's basically evolved to bind major polysaccharides found in the, that are found from degradation of plant cell wall over sort of smaller monosaccharides. So this is a key downstream enzyme in the breakdown of the polysaccharide I showed you before. Now to get at this, we employ tools of, of chemical synthesis where we can make congeners of substrates which have either the full complement of branching sugars or we selectively synthesize these with, for example, the three xyloses here in blue or adding on through the lactose. And by introducing, for example, chromogenic leaving groups, stuff that Steve Withers does so very well, we can generate enzyme kinetics and we can do comparative analyses of these enzymes. So what is the point of all this? Well, if we know how fast these enzymes do their job, we can select the best catalysts for making the right cocktail, for example, for breaking down uh, plant cell wall biomass. We can turn that synthetic ability to making chromogenic substrates so we can actually watch enzyme activity in real time in plant cell walls. So this particular substrate gets cleaved by a hydrolytic enzyme releasing a fluorophore. And what you're watching here is a time lapse of that cleavage happening and visualizing the enzyme activity in real time. And this is really interesting when we start looking at recycling of plant cell wall during growth, uh, looking at transgenes to analyze what happens if we knock down or turn up that enzyme, and looking at plant pathogen interactions, for example. But now really what I want to kind of focus on in the last bit of the talk here, or the rest of the talk, is one of the technologies that we developed, um, which we term of biomimetic technology. We draw some inspiration from the way the plant cell wall is built up and modified. So this enzyme class, uh, the XETs or xyloglucan endotransglucosylases, is an enzyme class that we've studied a lot from a biochemical perspective. So we know a lot about how these enzymes work. And knowing a lot about the mechanism allows us to apply it for putting in functional groups into cellulosic fibers. So what's the background for this? Well, I think many of you appreciate that modification of fiber surface chemistry is really important in a lot of cellulose-based products. Okay. If you're looking at paper, there's a tremendous amount of surface treatment that goes on to make papers hydrophobic. If we're talking about biocomposites, we need to make cellulosic fibers compatible with hydrophobic 
matrices. If we're looking at, for example, wound treatments, there's an interest in putting antimicrobial uh, functionality on these. Of course, in the textile industry, there's a lot of, of high-performance textiles that are either waterproof or uh, have dyes and, and other functional groups attached to them. And then we can think about modification of nanocellulosis. In this case, bacterial cellulose is a, is a wound uh, dressing. So again, putting either growth factors or antimicrobials can be interesting to alter the surface properties. Now the issue is that you can modify cellulose using classic chemical techniques pretty well. People have been doing that for a very long time. But the key aspect of cellulose and cellulosic fibers is that a lot of their interesting material properties comes from the crystalline nature of the cellulose. And the more you start functionalizing these hydroxyl groups with well, functional groups, the more the crystallinity and the, and the material properties are broken down. I think you can appreciate the difference be between cellulose in a sheet of paper and cellulose triacetate in an overhead transparency sheet. Really completely different chemicals. So, and as we sort of move down into the nanocellulose regime, there are especially big problems with um, having to do solvent exchange to modify cellulose. In the case of nanofibers, they tend to like to aggregate, form gels, if you take them below 1% or above 1% in, in suspension. And very often, some, you know, as I was alluding to, modification of crystalline nanostructure uh, really destroys material properties, especially at the nanocrystalline level. And there's a lot of interest, really, in, in using nano and microcrystalline cellulose and material properties. So our solution or in the new material. So our solution to this was, again, to take this biomimetic approach where we draw some inspiration from the plant cell wall. And what we see when we look at, when we analyze the primary cell wall, are these cellulose microfibrils coated and cross-linked with hemicelluloses, xyloglucan in particular. So these are really, um, it's really sort of load-bearing semi-crystalline fibers within a hydrogel-like matrix, which give the cell wall its plasticity and, and dynamic aspects. So xyloglucan is this polysaccharide here. It's this complex beta-1 glucan, beta-1 forward glucan, with a number of, of xylose residues and galactose added in a very regular pattern. And we also have this enzyme that I was talking about that's endogenous to the plant cell wall, which coats and re or, sorry, which cleaves and re-ligates these crosslinks to allow cell wall expansion. Okay, so combining the ability of xyloglucan to stick to cellulose with the ability of this plant cell wall enzyme to do catalysis, we can use that for cellulose fiber functionalization. So I won't go a lot in or in detail into the biochemistry of, of XETs in the plant cell wall, but as I mentioned, they cleave xyloglucan cross links, they form a covalent intermediate, a stable enzyme intermediate that is not <coughs> hydrolyzed. If this were hydrolyzed, the wall would just simply fall apart. But in fact, this intermediate is stable enough that it waits around for another xyloglucan chain to undergo transplant oscillation to reform that crosslink. Now you can actually visualize this enzyme activity in the plant cell wall by feeding in short oligosaccharides, the minimum unit of the polymer, with a, flor uh, a fluorophoric uh, group at the, at, the, at the reducing end. Sorry. So this oligosaccharide will intercept this intermediate and get attached in the cell wall at the place where the enzyme is, is highly active. And we can see it here in the developing cambium of a poplar tree. So these are the cells that are undergoing the most rapid expansion and, uh, and division. So since we can intercept that intermediate in vivo, we can also intercept it in vitro. So we can take xyloglucan dissolved in, in solution, we can take our enzyme, the yeah. XCT, we can feed in short chemically modified oligosaccharides, and we can use though, the enzyme to recombine these to make N labeled xyloglucans. And because of this affinity of xyloglucan for cellulose, we can use that, exploit that anchoring ability of the polymer, of the polysaccharide, to bring this functional group onto cellulose surfaces. So, how does this work? Well, really, we can think of the need for the sort of molecular toolbox where we have high molecular weight xyloglucan. Now here's where the biorefining concept or the 
the biorefinery stream concept comes in. Xyloglucan is actually a waste product of the tamarind paste industry. So it's actually um, produced in the seeds of the tamarind tree. The, the, ta the tamarind pod contains a pectin-like substa substance, which is then used as a souring agent in different foodstuffs. And the seeds are basically a waste product. And they've been used for quite a long time in India as a textile size as a consequence of their, in, in particular, the cellulose binding growth. We can break those down then using commercial enzymes to make these oligosaccharides. And then using standard carbohydrate chemistry, we can install a functional group here at the, at the reducing end. And then we need the enzyme, which recombines the two, the, those two pieces. So the proof of principle, we simply made an oligosaccharide which was fluorescently labeled, mix them together, we get a population of these N-modified xyloglucans. Because this is an enzyme control process, we can carefully control the molecular weight of these species. It turns out that you need a, a chain length of about five oligosaccharide repeats to actually get binding. So these don't bind on their own to cellulose. Bind them to cellulose microfibrils, and then we can show very clearly, for example, in this filter paper, that we get the fluorophore incorporated. Whereas in the control sheet, where no enzyme has been added, these little oligosaccharides are not sufficient to bind to, to the cellulose structure. So in fact, you need this part of the molecule to act as an anchor. And we were able to show that this works for many, many different types of cellulose. So it works on wood pulps, obviously in the Swedish context, just like the PC context. There's a, a huge pulp and paper industry. So for functionalizing wood fibers, this is extremely important. Um, cotton, we use Wattman number one filter paper as a surrogate, a surrogate for, for textiles. But in fact, we also show that you can bind uh, this works on, on cotton and textiles. Regenerated cellulose, uh, you dissolve cellulose and reprecipitate it, works just fine. And nanocellulose, such as bacterial cellulose. I'll come back to the importance of this in a moment, but basically, the neat thing about adding this material in water is that we completely maintain the structure of the hydrogel network, which comprises bacterial cellulose. Now, of course, messing around with fluorophores is all great in the lab. It gives you nice colors. But actually, there are some practical applications of this. And many paper sheets are actually treated with optical brightening agents, which are small molecules of the stilby variety. And it turns out that these are retained actually very, very poorly onto cellulosic fibers. They don't have a, a very high intrinsic binding affinity. So what we actually did was we conjugated them to xyloglucan. And because xyloglucan sticks really like glue to cellulose, we were able to vastly improve the retention of these small molecules on the surface. So this slide just trivially shows some hand sheets we made in the lab that we could load xyloglucan and that, that still being fluorophore on in a dose-dependent manner. Okay, so we could get really, really good retention there. Also, and again, this is for the, the, uh, my colleagues in the Pulp and Paper Center, just to show that Xyloglucan has this interesting property that because it cross-links cellulose, it actually improves paper sheets on its own. So you sort of get a, a double effect here. We can use it to deliver chemistry. We can also use it to make stronger paper. Now, in an industrial collaboration we had funded by Renova, one of the first things we wanted to test was, well, does fiber type, does pulp type actually influence binding? And as you might guess, because this is a specific interaction between xyloglucan and cellulose, that thermomechanical pulps, which retain a large amount of lignin, don't bind xyloglucan as well. So the more clean the cellulosic surface is, the more xyloglucan you bind. So a caveat to all this is that it works great for many, many different types of chemical pulps, um, bleached and unbleached. But for thermomechanical pulps, we get correspondingly less binding. Okay. And the neat thing was we were able to use pulps from three commercial suppliers in, in Sweden for this. Now, in addition to incre increasing sheet strength, the addition of xyloglucan has this other effect that being sort of a, if you like, a molecular lubricant, it improves sheet formation. So it reduces fiber-fiber interactions in the, in the pulp suspension. So as a consequence, you get improved formation when the sheet is formed. 
And we could actually show that it both improves formation in a collaboration we had with uh, Tom Lindstrom in North Carolina. But then some later work, we were able to show that you can get a nice synergism by adding xyloglucan and, for example, borax as an additional cross-linking agent. So here, xyloglucan coats and cross-links the, the fibers in the paper sheet, gives it increased strength, just like it does in the plants on the wall. But addition of another cross-linking chemical bumps that up even further. So from a purely practical paper-making point of view, this is a nice example of how you can use really a renewable polymer to achieve the same sort of strength increase as you can with a, a petrochemical polymer. And we were able to show through a nice collaboration with Mark Rutland, uh, who really uh, is the guy who invented the colloidal probe technique using cellulose to look at cellulose-cellulose interactions, that this initial reduction of friction in the wet state uh, is caused by the lubricating effect of xyloglucan. But for example, if you take a model cellulose sphere and bring it into contact with a model cellulose surface in the presence of xyloglucan, you get slow molecular rearrangement and increased cross-linking. So the longer you hold those um, two surfaces in contact in the presence of xyloglucan, the harder they are to pull apart. So basically, this acts initially in a wet state as a lubricant. And as sheets dry, then we get increased cross-linking, very similar to what's happening in the cell wall. And when you get total desiccation, then you have uh, maximum strength. So what we're looking at here is the reduction in friction. We're looking at the increased force to pull those apart with increased time of contact. And then finally, we were able to actually make thiol-labeled xyloglucans to tether them onto QCM and, uh, surfaces to look at both enzyme interactions and cellulose xyloglucan interactions using both AFM and, uh, and QCM. So really to come back to the, to the chemistry of the materials functionalization side of things, we tested a whole range of functional groups. So the first proof of concept I showed you here was this trivial addition of, of fluorescein onto paper surfaces. If we just put amino groups on as sort of reactive electrophiles, um, sorry, nucleophiles, then we can do modification directly on the paper surface. We can put in these optical, optically active or light active agents. We can put in small molecules to carry out biomolecule capture, so to capture enzyme complexes, and use those really as a reporter for um, <coughs> proof of concept in bioactive packaging, for example, or bioactive paper surfaces. I'll come back to this concept in a minute. We can put on thiol groups, which nicely undergo redox chemistry so we can functionalize and then cleave and functionalize so we can put recycling chemistry on the surface. And then finally, we can put on initiators for radical polymerization, which allow us to build up polymers in a controlled fashion off the surface. So I'll talk about that now. But basically, the business end of this molecule is this, this bromine atom which makes it a substrate for atom transfer radical polymerization. So in the presence of a copper catalyst and with methyl methacrylate or even styrene, we can polymerize in a controlled fashion polymers off of the cellulose surface using the xyloglucan as sort of an interface or a comp compatibilizing player. So we can put on these functional groups, attach them to cellulose without having to worry about modifying cellulose at all. So we can do this binding chemistry and aqueous solution, and then we can transfer these over to ATRP conditions. We can grow polymers off the surface, so in the case of polymerizing methyl methacrylate, we can watch the increase in absorbance of the carbonyl group with increasing conversion. We can show the molecular weight increases linearly with increasing conversion, and we can show that the polydispersity is in fact very low. So now on a paper sheet, this doesn't make a lot of really so much difference that we have controlled polymerization. But if we're thinking about nanos, cellulose nanostructures, to be able to control polymer length, to grow all these polymers at the same rate uh, constantly throughout the polymerization, can be really useful for uh, tailoring molecular architectures. And of course, at the end of the day, we can make a paper sheet that, well, in the case of this filter paper, doesn't filter water anymore. This drop will stand there until it evaporates. So we can make surfaces very, very hydrophobic, if we like. And what's interesting about that is that they're inherently compatibilized. That is, these fibers can be more easily mixed than because of this interface layer, 
with hydrophobic polymers for making biocomposites. We can extend this and have extended this to ring opening polymerization for making biodegradable polymers. We can imagine, we haven't done this yet, but we can imagine going to raft polymerization to do a completely aqueous polymerization. So again, we can take cellulose fibers, bind xyloglucan in water, do the polymerization in water, and essentially have a completely green chemical approach for, for cellulose surface modification. And of course, when we're talking about potential products, we can imagine liquid packaging, biocomposites, and for example, there's a big interest in, in making auto parts, especially interior door panels, out of uh, cellulose fiber plastic composites, both to reduce weight and to increase the green uh, feeling of these materials. I won't spend too much time on this. This just shows that by attaching a different initiator, this uh, 1,3-diol, then we can polymerize either uh, caprolactone or lactide to build up either polycaprolactone or PLLA type polymers. And the interesting thing about this now is that we've used a bio, uh, biodegradable um, fiber together with a biodegradable polymer. And a neat sort of side effect we saw of this is you can do this polymerization directly off cellulose surface. So you don't need the xyloglucan. You can append that, that initiator directly to cellulose using chemical approaches. If you use xyloglucan, however, the fact that we have this molecular anchor here, which is susceptible to enzyme treatment, means that we can, on fiber, treat with classical de-inking enzymes, which cut up the anchor, and then allow this polymer to be floated off. Because essentially, by cutting the backbone here, we lose affinity, and then the ability of that polymer to partition off into solvent greatly increases. Okay, so we can recycle actually without touching the fiber if we use an enzyme that's very specific for xyloglucan but does not cut cellulose. Okay, so advantages and disadvantages to the chemical approach. The chemical, the chemical 